Let's have a look into the future. With award-winning futurist, researcher, and keynote speaker Nicholas Batminton on Canada Now. And Nick, let's look into the world's first Hyperloop train route. There's a big race to see who can get it done first. Yeah, and uh, what, what's really interesting about using pneumatic tubes for travel is it's not necessarily a, a new idea. It's just that now they want to take it into the 21st century and beyond. Yeah, like like mankind has, has really been working on this or leading up to this for about two centuries, right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, 1799 was the first time uh, um, someone actually proposed the idea to, to move goods through a cast iron pipe using air pressure. And, and then sort of through the mid-1850s, uh, pneumatic railways were built in like Dublin, London and Paris, and then in New York City. And then I, um, we've probably seen a lot of old movies where you move mail across New York City through pneumatic pipes, and that happened in a lot of major cities around the world. But, but now we're sort of in, in this sort of modern space age where we're thinking, okay, what if we can build a Hyperloop? And what if we can travel at 1,200 kilometers an hour? Uh, you know, in, in, you talk about those old movies like at, you know, newspapers where they, they had those, those vacuum pipes or whatever to, to move things around. I always wanted to have those in my house. Yeah, exactly. It's uh, it, it's absolutely fascinating, and it still runs. Uh, it's quite futuristic in a way. And uh, what they're doing is they're trying to really think about how we can really build these this sort of infrastructure to help people travel from one place to the next very, very quickly. Did you know Elon Musk come up with the modernization of the idea? Uh, you know what? He he was riffing on a number of different ideas that really uh, sort of came out and patents that were sort of uh, submitted in the 1970s by American sort of defense contract companies. Um, so he's sort of riffing on that. But he said, you know, here's the idea. Let's set a competition. Let's get teams out there to try and really crack this and actually become the future of Hyperloop travel, right? It, it's kind of so so many people don't have to, you know, jump into aircraft. It would be better for the environment. People can get there more quickly and hopefully more safely as well. Okay, so before we talk about uh, who might win the race and, and, uh, and uh, where it might be, let's talk a bit more about what it actually is. Can you tell us a bit about how the system works? Yeah, so so you, you, you ostensibly you have a pipe, and, and within that pipe you have a very close-fitting uh, carriage that actually travels uh, using pneumatics and, uh, and a number of other technologies at a very fast uh, rate of speed. That, that's completely oversimplified, to be honest. <laughs> we, we've already seen um, in Japan, you know, the bullet trains, you know, they go up to like 320 kilometers an hour, maglev goes up to... 603 kilometers an hour so this is just the sort of the 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 growing up of that concept of getting from a to b very very quickly you know very i think it's very science fiction and i think that it, it will come to be but i do think that there's a huge amount of problems with actually building out the infrastructure we see a lot of uh, activism around building pipelines across countries and and right now it's carrying oil but you've still got the same problem of building pipelines across country uh, across countries uh, when you're actually transferring people through a hyperloop as well. It's still very much above ground, and maybe in the future they'll think about sinking that into in, in underneath the earth. Well, I, I had read uh, with with one of the articles that that we've shared um, that construction could happen like underwater. Like it, 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 these these yeah. pipelines could be like underwater. Yeah, absolutely. If you think about it, just if you can sink it out of the way, it could be nice and quick. If you think across like either the east or the west coast of North America and say you can get into a Hyperloop terminal in, in Vancouver, British Columbia, and suddenly, I don't know, less than an hour later, pop out in L.A., that's going to be incredible. Maybe even within sort of 30 minutes or so. And that could all be run underwater. But you've got to remember, building out this infrastructure would cost trillions of dollars. And then you have to operate it. And then people still have to pay probably fairly exorbitant prices for tickets. And if you build a Hyperloop, you can only go one way at a time because you've got a single pipe. That means that then you have to think about, okay, what are our multiple pipes? What does that look like? What do schedules look like? You know, there's, there's lots of barriers in the way. There's lots of things that need to be solved. But, you know, this is what innovation is all about. I hadn't thought about uh, the pipe being one way. Uh, it's right. Like I, I pictured, I pictured like the subway, you know, just like a souped up yeah. subway, you know. Um, well, in terms of time spent when you're getting into one of these pods and and taking this this hyperloop train, 
Um, Musk had tweeted in 2017 that Washington to New York would take 29 minutes. Hyperloop yeah. One is looking at Toronto to Montreal taking 39 minutes, which would be awesome because that's a that's a boring six hour drive on the 401 between uh, here and Toronto to Montreal. <laughs> Toronto to Ottawa yeah. 27 minutes. Ottawa to Montreal 12 minutes. That sounds like right. a dream. Yeah, it's a dream, but terribly difficult to actually implement this new infrastructure, right? <laughs> um, I actually think the places where this is this is going to really be sort of tested out uh, will be uh, places where there's vast expanses of land uh, and, and no one there. So like um, places like Dubai and, and Saudi Arabia and whatever. Um, in fact, uh, earlier this year in July... Um, the, the government of Maharashtra uh, was one of the first uh, proponents of this technology. And what they want to do is they want to link Pune to Mumbai so that people can travel in under 35 minutes, versus, which is like 10 times faster than it t- taking uh, getting there by road, right? Mm. So it, it's actually really interesting um, that, that some people are actually saying, yes, let's do it. But at what cost? They have to basically get people out of the way of where the pipeline is. And maybe in India, they think that that's a little bit easy, easier than maybe starting on the east coast of America or, or wherever. Well, and, and maybe it does end up in, in, in places like, like Saudi Arabia and all the, the ones that you had mentioned, because where's the money coming from? Who's actually paying for this? Who's actually backing it? Because uh, like, I wonder if politics would play a part in, in, in location countries heavily investing in companies racing in construction of the first Hyperloop uh, train route. Uh, maybe they, they have demands like, hey, we'll back you on the technology. But if you're doing it, you're not doing it where you are in, in New York or, or uh, in the U.S. or in Canada. You're doing it where I am, and, and I'm here in, let's say, Saudi Arabia. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, Saudi's got uh, hundreds of billions of dollars uh, of accessible funds and, and, you know, and money to invest in new tech startups. That's what they're doing. I mean, they dumped three billion dollars into Uber. We we know that they're they're sort of out there and they're really playing with this. Um, not necessarily a, a smart move by Uber, but I guess they're just focused on the cash. But you know, it, it's interesting. Yes, people want to buy their way into the future, and uh, that's kind of always been the way. It's just that. People don't always do it correctly. Uh, and technology like this is, you know, there's human lives uh, at stake here. So it has to be done properly. So we're going slowly at the moment. Let's get it right. And then let's work out where we can implement it. But it, it's very much going to be like how Concorde used to work. So Concorde only really was going to revolutionize uh, flights around the world, but it was too loud. Uh, so it didn't really operate for that long. And then there's a disaster um, and, uh, across a couple of routes, and then it shut down as a program, right? It's going to happen with Hyperloop. People will spend an incredible amount of money, and it will be in two or three places around the world, and suddenly, yeah, it, it's going to be interesting to see, you know, how that's being used and how it sort of changes over time. But this isn't going to be, I personally think, this isn't going to be a standard way of getting around North America, or across Europe, and whatever. I think it's going to be very specific routes, and uh, it's going to be routes for quite wealthy people to get from A to B, I think. Have, to your knowledge, have have tracks been built? Like, have systems been um, blueprinted at all? Are we moving forward uh, anywhere in the world with this at all, or is it still so preliminary? Yeah, you know, there are test tracks. As I said, uh, you know, Maharashtra in uh, in India is is starting to look at, Mm. you know, trying to make it happen there. When you're starting to do it at scale, you, you know, you, you're really sort of at that, the cutting edge. You know, first mover um, advantage is not is kind of very costly. You know, it, people are going to watch this project. They're going to watch what went wrong, how they fixed the problems. And then once it's proven and the costs come down and it can be deployed at scale, you know, four or five other destinations around the world will implement this. And, and then we'll see... Uh, if it, if it catches on fire as a, as a new way to travel around uh, um, certain countries very quickly. Mm, yeah, hopefully not, not, not literally catching on, on fire. Um, <laughs> and again, in thinking about, like, in picturing, like, some kind of, like, subway that, that is this Hyperloop train, uh, which, which is incorrect. It, it, that's, that's not the way uh, to think about it. I, I had me thinking, well, I, I, well that's, that's maybe like 100-some-odd people on, on this train. But these, uh, these pods, um, like in Musk's design, he's got sealed pods containing only 28 people. 
Yeah, you know, this is it. It's for the exclusive uh, use, right? Mm. Um, I, I kind of wonder, you know, what are gonna be, what's going to be the effect on those people at, uh, when it's traveling at very high speeds? I've traveled on, like, the bullet train in Japan. It's amazing. But, like, how are you going to suddenly compensate for traveling 1,200 kilometers an hour? Right. How are you mm. going to equalize that? How, you know, what, what's going to be the human effect? So I think that a major part of the, the deployment of this is really working out that human element of, of the whole solution. Well, how did you feel on the bullet train? I felt, I felt perfectly fine. But if you think about it, it's, it's like the way that you actually create kinetic, kinetic movement and you're traveling 320 kilometers an hour is pretty good. But, you know, 1,200 kilometers an hour for a human to travel at that speed – you know, the, the potential for actually feeling G-force and whatever, it's like getting into a stunt plane and then going into a dive. So they've got to work this out, really. I don't know the, the precise physics, uh, but, you know, people write to me if they know the precise physics around this. But, you know, humans are going to feel a little bit strange when they do this, right? Yeah. It, it's gonna, you're going to have to find your Hyperloop legs. Check out NicholasBadminton.com, futurist, researcher, keynote speaker, Nicholas Badminton. Nick, always a pleasure, my friend. Thanks for doing this. I'll speak to you very soon, Jeff. I look forward to it. Thank you. Always look into the future uh, with our futurist, uh, Nick Badminton.